So we've looked at control in our program flow based on conditions and, and, and what's going on. It's often a necessity to want to do something a number of times, um, and we don't want to write you know, one line of code 20 times to do something 20 times. So I'm assuming there must be something within C and Objective-C that allows us to do something uh, repeatedly well, sort of, you know, a number of times or based on certain conditions or whatever as well. Right. What you're basically talking about there is loops. You yeah. know, we want to we want to do something a bunch of times. Um, maybe we want to do it until some condition is met or um, for a set number of times, those kinds of things. All of that really falls under, under the concept of loops. And Objective-C gives you um, three different loop constructs. Basically, it gives you the for loop, the while loop and the do while loop, which is really sort of, you know, more, it, it's almost a while loop, but it's a little bit different and kind of specialized. So we'll treat each one of those um, separately. So the first thing, probably the simplest of those three constructs is the for loop. And uh, I've got an example here, uh, some example code, where basically we're passing in um, this object. It's object, it's an array. Mm -hmm. Now, We'll talk about objects in the next section. So when we're looking at this code, don't be too scared. I'll, I'll explain what we've got going on here. But, um, but for now, we're really focused on looking at the for construct itself and not the objects. Right. I'm bringing in objects here because there is a specialized version of for specifically for working with objects that's really cool. And we want to make sure that we cover that. And because we're talking about loops here, this is probably the best place to at least have an introduction of it. Okay. So the purpose of this code here is we have this, this function called my function, and we pass in this array. And the idea is <clears throat> for the first 30 items in that array, we want to do something with each one of those items. And so what we're going to do is we're going to make this for loop that's going to execute this block of code for each iteration of the for loop. Now, the way that you control the flow of the for loop itself is by working with the statement given in the parentheses to the for loop. Now, if you look here, there's actually three statements inside of these parentheses. The first one is the declaration of the control variable for the for loop. Usually, you're going to do something like, you know, an int here, or actually a more appropriate uh, thing to use here, based on our types that we were talking about working with integers and so forth, is maybe an ns integer. Right. Right? So, in this case, we have this ns integer, and we're going to, um, we're going to call it n, and we're going to assign it, at first, a value of 0. So, this first statement here is only executed the first time you come into the for loop. Right, so okay. it creates this, this integer called n, assigns it to 0. And this integer n, its scope is just going to be the for loop. In other words, correct. it's slightly outside of our curly braces here, but because it's declaring a for loop, that's its scope yes. as a variable. It's part of that for loop, that whole compound statement. It doesn't exist outside of that okay. for loop compound statement. The second statement inside the parentheses for the for loop is the conditional statement. And what, it, what the for loop will do is it will continue to execute the for loop as long as the conditional statement is true. Right, so as long as n is less than 30, right. it will do this code. Precisely. Okay. Uh, so the next question that you have to ask yourself is, okay, so I understand I'm creating this n, I'm starting it out at a value of 0, and I'm going to break out of this for loop when n reaches 30. So how does n get changed? And the answer is, there's a third statement also that you can put into the for loop that enables that will be executed on each iteration through the for loop. And you use that third statement to actually change the value of your control variable. Right. So in this particular case, we're actually incrementing n on each iteration through our for loop. So does that get run after the iteration or before the iteration? Or It'll be run um, after the iteration. So what will happen is you'll come in here, you'll, you'll have the first iteration will be 0, and it will execute the body of the for loop. 
and then it'll come up and it will then execute. Remember I said that the, the first statement is only executed the first time you come mm -hmm. in. Each time after that first iteration, it'll execute that third statement. So it'll increment the n variable, and um, then you can use that n variable inside of your, your function then to do stuff. So I hit this for loop. Mm -hmm. The first time it sets up n and sets it to zero. Right. It evaluates that against the condition. Right. Which is, is n less than 30? Yes. Right. So it runs my two lines of code, which we'll look at in a moment. Yes. It goes back to the for loop does the third statement within that line, which right. increments n, because it's got the um, plus plus operator, which will operate on n. Right. Then we'll evaluate it. against the code. Correct. Is it still true? Go do the code around. Exactly. And keep going until exactly. such time as that middle statement is not true. Exactly. OK. All of that may sound a little bit complicated, but it's actually just really simple. Because all you really need to know is you just say, you know, look, for my initial condition, semicolon, then my end condition, semicolon, and then however I want to change my conditional variable. Now, I made an interesting statement there when I said, however I want to change my conditional variable. You're not just limited there on that final statement to uh, just incrementing by one, you know, n plus plus. This could even be something like n plus two, in which case you would jump two spaces mm -hmm. each time. It could be, n times 20 or something. You know, whatever you want, you can put in there. Any, any, any valid statement is perfectly fine. So any function, I could put a function call in there? Uh, yes, you, well, yeah, you could. Basically, um, the point is I have to set the value of n somehow. Correct. For this iteration. Correct, correct. And actually, I should say it would be n plus equals 2 there because you want to assign the value to n. Yes. Does that make sense? Yep, makes, makes loads of sense. So uh, now inside of, now typically what you would do with this for loop is you would use the value of n to do something inside of that for loop. And again, the idea here is that what you want to do here is, is we want to pull out each n element of the array and do something, right? right. So that's what this code here does, is we take our array and we say object at index n, so we're going to get the nth element of that array. We're going to put it into the foo variable there. And then we're going to say, foo, go do something. So this is going to take the first 30 elements of the array, and it's going to call the do something method on each of those elements. Make sense? Yep. Cool stuff. And we'll understand the array stuff later. Yes, the array stuff we'll discuss in the next chapter. Now, there's another companion um, statement that can be used inside of loops called the continue statement, as we see here. So this is kind of the same code that we just saw. You know, we've got our for, and we'll change this again to, uh, to be an ns integer. And again, you know, you want to use ns integer in these loops. A lot of times when you're working with older code from, from old Cocoa applications or, or things like that, you'll see a lot of people just use integers or longs, those kinds of things. But really, you want to use NS integer for, for loops like this where you're dealing with objects. Mm -hmm. Because the highest possible element index of an array will be whatever the highest number is that an NS integer is. That's why they were created. Right. So again, we have this for NS integer, n equals 0, n is less than 30, increment n. OK, so we do each one of those. But now we have this conditional inside of our for statement. And what this is going to do is if n is greater than 20 and or is greater than 10 and n is less than 20. So in other words, if it's between 11 and 19, yep. respectively, then we actually want to skip those guys. We don't want to we don't want to deal with them. And so we call the continue statement. And what that will actually do is it will just jump right back up here for the next iteration of the loop. Right, so at any point in my loop I put continue, Right. it abandons the rest of that iteration. Correct. Goes back to the for loop, yep. does its thing and starts again. Yes. Now if, you, if this evaluates to false, if we're not going to do the continue here, then we'll come down here and we'll just do the regular statements that we would have done before. 
Okay. Make sense? Yep. So that's the continue statement. And that's, you know, some people use that, like I said, for skipping over certain elements, things like that. You know, you've got the, you've got the ability to do a stepped iteration using the, you know, n plus equals two or whatever. Um, but this is another way to sort of maybe skip a range of elements or maybe, you know, to basically to, to affect the flow of your for loop while you're inside of the for loop. So what if I'm going through a for loop to try and ascertain something? Doesn't mm -hmm. really matter what. Okay. Now, in order to ascertain it, I've got to go over, you know, loop over these 50 things. Mm -hmm. yeah. But as soon as I, you know, I might be able to ascertain that something is, is, is true and I can continue on you know, after just doing 20 of them. Is, is there any way I can sort of say, okay, I've done that. I don't want to do the other 25 iterations of this loop. I don't need to do them anymore because I right. know that I've finished doing what I'm doing. Can I break out of this loop at any point? Well, you could obviously set your, um, your control variable to to the end value if you wanted to. That's one way you could. So you I can change it inside my loop if I need to. Right, you could okay. do that if you wanted to. Um, you can also use the break statement right here as well. Ah, right, like we saw in just Switch. Just like we saw in Switch. So, uh, well, let's say... Uh, but we don't want it just there, this, though, did right? I? We wouldn't want it there. <laughs> let's say we came here and we said, if n is equal to um, 25, right, then break. Right, so when n was 25, break would take me right out of the loop altogether. Right. Now that doesn't really make a lot of sense in this no, particular this is, this loop because you know we're iterate you know we might as well set our our, our top limit to twenty five right, um, but there's lots of cases you know maybe you're even uh, calculating a new value for n each time you go through here if you wanted to, um, you could do those kinds of things without any problems. Well, I'm thinking like when you're checking a whole bunch of conditions and it only takes one of them to be true Absolutely. before you want to continue well, on, and so you don't if once you find one that's true, there's no point in checking the others. Right. I mean, here's an example that's that actually makes a little bit more sense. If we did if, and then we checked a return code from do something, and if that evaluates true, then we break. Yeah. That would be a case that's where a sort of that's exactly the kind of thing that you're talking about there. So that's another example of sort of this simplified for loop where you're basically iterating over the elements of an array or you're iterating, you know, basically you're, you're counting from some number to some number. The starting value, you know, in both of these cases, we've set n to zero, but that could be anything. It could be if n, you know, we could set n to a hundred to start with. Um, one of the, one common error that I do want to take a moment to point out is Usually, when you're doing this kind of code, you're going to do something like this where we're doing this n is less than 30. It's important to remember that Objective-C, just like C in most other languages, starts counting most things at zero. So you want to start off usually most of these things with zero, and then even though an array might contain 30 elements, because it starts at zero, its last subscriptable element would actually be wind up being element number 29. Mm. So you don't actually want to say, for example, n is equal to 30, because that would actually not be an element that's in your array. So that's an important error that sometimes developers will run into. Is It's called an off-by-one error. Right, yeah. It depends. If you've come from a language that is one-based right. arrays, you're going to find that difficult. If you come from a language already with zero-based arrays, right. Probably you're fine. Most. And if it's your first language, you've just got to learn how to do it properly. Exactly. And you'll be fine. <laughs> Now, the third form of the for loop that I wanted to touch on, again, is this, is this uh, fast enumeration uh, concept. So, in Objective-C 2.0, which is the newest version of Objective-C, um, Apple added this really cool thing called fast enumeration. Nine times out of ten, when you're dealing with loops, you're usually going to be iterating over these arrays or dictionaries that contain objects. And so Apple added this cool thing that lets you, well, you're, you're basically going to be doing constructs like what we've seen here. So, so you're going to get the object at this particular index of the array, and you're going to assign it to some variable called foo, and then you're going to go do something with it, right? Well, fast enumeration kind of makes all that stuff much easier. Essentially, all you have to do is you say for, and then the control variable that you want the each element of the array stored in for each right. iteration of this array. So this is just like declaring our foo in the top example. 
we're just doing it inside our construct here. Precisely. <clears throat> and so essentially what you do is you say for object in array. And what it'll do is it'll loop over each element of that array, pull out each element, stuff it into foo, and then foo is then available inside the scope of the, of the for loop code block automatically for free. And you didn't have to do any of the um, counting with the n or anything like that. You didn't have to have this sort of temporary variable that does all that stuff for you. You just say for object in array, and then you can do foo do something. That works in arrays and objects. And I guess we maybe will come back and uh, look again, but, but just be aware, I guess, you, right. iteration over objects is, can use, is that called fast enumeration? It's called fast enumeration. Uh, we'll deal with this in much more detail when we're dealing with the collections section of this course, um, because this really just works with collections of objects. So arrays, dictionaries, sets, those kinds of things. Great. So uh, that's four. Right. Now, the other kind of loops that Objective-C provides us with is while loops. So and there's the while and there's the do while. We'll talk about the while first. Now, the for loop is convenient when you have, when you want to work with indexing things, when you want to count over a certain number of things and things like that. The while loop is a little bit more convenient when, for example, you might have a control variable that's already set somewhere. So in other words, like in this first example, okay, I have this function called my function, and it's being passed a value x. And I don't know what x is initially. You know, um, in the for loops, we had to set x to something, right? So in a while loop, x is assumed to already be created and sitting outside you know, in the, in the outer scope of your, of your method. So what it does basically is it's going to execute the body of this loop again. And each time it's going to check to see if the conditional statement for the while loop is true or false. And as long as the conditional statement for the while loop is true, then it will continue to execute the code inside of the while code block. Okay. So in other words, we get this value x in here, and assuming x is less than 10, it will execute that code. And it will continue to do that until x is no longer less than 10. Now, in this particular case, very you know, simply, I'm just incrementing x again inside of this uh, while loop. But you could do all kinds of other things in here. For example, you could call another function and have it assign a value to x or, or whatever if you wanted to. Um, now, an important distinction as far as the while loop and where it's used in things is, of course, that the while conditional statement is going to be executed the first time you enter this block of code, right? So because of that, it's possible that your while statement might not be executed at all. Right. Because x might come in and it might already be greater than 10. Maybe you want to have your code block executed at least once before you actually um, before you actually check the statement. And that's where the do while statement comes in. Right, okay. Now we'll talk about that in just a second, but I just wanted to point that out, that it's important to realize that it's possible that your while might not execute at all. It'll check that conditional statement and then just jump right over the, the additional Because every time code. while checks a conditional, runs the code. Exactly. So if your conditional is never true, it's never going to run the code. Exactly. Okay. Now, an, an important use of the while loop is in looking at older code. You remember I mentioned that fast enumeration it was a new addition to Objective-C that came about in Objective-C 2.0, right? Well, now, let's just clear that up for a moment. Objective-C 2.0 is always being available. This construct is always available on all versions of the iPhone. Right. And uh, the iPod iPhone, Touch, the iPod, iPad. Our iPod Touch, iPad, and Mac OS 10 after Leopard. So 10.5? Yes. Okay, so Objective-C 2 has been available on those devices. Correct. Okay, right. So, um, so you have this fast enumeration capability available to you on, um, on all of those platforms. And really, 
use fast enumeration if you can. But if you're dealing with older code, um, there before fast enumeration came around, came about, there was another form of enumeration that was used for enumerating over arrays of objects, and that is the NS enumerator pattern. So again, we have this same thing here. We're passing in this array to this function, right? And we want to iterate over each element of the array and do something with it. The way that you, that used to be done is you would actually ask the array for an object enumerator, and then you would make this while loop where you construct or where you would take the next object from the enumerator on each iteration of this while loop and then essentially you would ask that for the next object and you would store that into that temporary variable again and then use that temporary variable inside of your inside of your while loop while loop body okay i i think Okay, we haven't covered arrays, we haven't covered objects. <clears throat> a lot of the syntax of that code is going to look really weird yeah. to people. So um, we've pointed that out here, what, and because it's a logical place, we're in enumeration. Right. Uh, so what I suggest that people do is, once we've covered objects and, and we've looked at some of this stuff, and this code might start to make more sense, uh, if you've got to deal with an older, older code base, uh, get familiar a bit later in the course with objects, then come back to this section and have a look at this bit again, right. and everything Jeeva just said will make sense. Absolutely. <laughs> we hope. <laughs> so, now the other, the final form of um, loops that I wanted to talk about was the do while statement. Now the do while statement is one of those statements that, um, for me, the way that I write code, I almost never use do while statements. Maybe once every six months, I might write a do while statement. But when I need it, it's exactly what I need. It's, you know, nothing else will do. It's precisely what I need. Uh, and the idea is that, again, looking at the while loop, right, you have while, and that's going to be executed the first time. If that conditional is false, then it won't execute the block, the code block for the, for the uh, while statement at all. Sometimes you want to execute that code block all the time, at least once. And in those cases, a do while statement is probably the best thing to do, because what it does is it lets you specify the code block to be run. And you say, do this stuff, and then check the while conditional after at the bottom of that loop. So you say, do this stuff, and then finally, while x is less than 10. So you can guarantee that code will always be run at least once. Correct. Even if x is greater than 10. Because it's going to run the code, then check the conditional. Correct. Now, I said when we started talking about compound statements that compound statements don't require semicolons at the end of them, right? You know, again, mm -hmm. you know, where to put semicolons, where not to put semicolons um, can be a confusion point for a lot of developers. The while statement, the do while statement, on the, however, is the only compound statement that actually does require a semicolon at the end of it. And the reason for that is because the while statement is used in these two different forms. You have the while statement with, um, with it at the top, and then you've got the do while statement. So if we actually look at this example here, what, what would happen if you didn't require semicolons at the end of a do while statement? You have this do that starts, and then you've got this while here in the middle of it, and the compiler would have a difficult time parsing whether this particular while goes with that do or not. So it's an important point to remember that, and actually, I left it off right there. You need that semicolon right there. There well, we are. We'd have just proven how bad that was if we tried to run that. Exactly. <laughs> so it's an important point to remember that that semicolon there on the end of that do while is actually required, whereas other compound statements it is not. That, that's that's an edge case and, and it is your case. case yeah. it's just that, learn it for this one. Do while that you that yeah. you write every six months or so. Others may write it more often. Yeah, Not everyone will follow your pattern. That's true. <laughs> uh, okay, so we've looked at whiles and we've looked at fours. Uh, are we done with looping and iteration? Do we need to look elsewhere? We are done with looping and iteration. Those are pretty much the the looping and iteration constructs in Objective C. Great. Now. 
we've covered a lot of stuff. Um, I think when we come back, time for a review. Sounds good. <laughs>